A few of us who are considered to be education frontliners, me included, have actual training in how young people learn. But I had to seek it out. That's right. The most fundamental part of education, learning, is often a mysterious or misunderstood process for many of us in education. So we shouldn't be surprised that our policies are so far behind what science tells us about how learning actually happens, about the ideal conditions for student health, learning, growth, and development. But that's changing. On today's show, we'll unpack the mystery of the whole child, a term that everybody's using and few people understand. Thanks for listening. I'm Joe Bishop. This is Our Children Can't Wait, a podcast about the systems and structures that keep our kids from flourishing. Our Children Can't Wait is also a book from Teachers College Press, available for purchase on Amazon. And if you're new to the Our Children Can't Wait podcast, please follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So what do we mean by whole child education? It's a term that's being defined and redefined every day. Whole child education includes holistic approaches to student learning and development. There we go again. What does that mean? Well, simply put, all young people need individualized support. Makes sense, right? Kids aren't learning robots with easy inputs and outputs. They're kids with needs that often go unmet, making learning tricky. So the education they get needs to be mindful of that. One size fits all approaches in education have dominated our past priorities, ignoring the unique talents and ways that kids stay engaged in their own learning. Policies can actually create major hurdles, like the obsession with testing at various grades, for instance. We've all heard about teachers dealing with the pressure of teaching to the test, right? The tests became the focus and actual learning got left behind. So when I found a leading expert who got it, I had to talk to her. Maybe you can relate. Have you ever emailed someone for days, weeks, or even years and wondered if they would ever respond? Well, (laughs) I spent several years trying to get in contact with Dr. Linda Darlene Hammond, who's one of the leading education scholars in the world. Linda is a very busy person. She's written countless books and articles as a professor emeritus at Stanford. She started the Learning Policy Institute and has been an advisor on education to US presidents, governors, and leaders across the country. Eventually, we ran into each other in line to get through a metal detector of all places. Linda will tell you that we've come pretty far over her career in our understanding of the great potential of kids and how young people best learn not as static beings, but rather as sponges that are growing and evolving based on the opportunities presented to them. This is Dr. Linda Darling Hammond. Hi, Joe. It's great to be with you. Right now, I am president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, which is designed to take what we know about teaching and learning and carry it into the policy arena for designing schools. And I am president of the State Board of Education in California. So Linda, let's let's start with you before we get into the, the chapter itself. If you could tell listeners more about your upbringing, how did your upbringing shape your interests as an educator and scholar today? Well, I was able to access education that was a major goal in my family. I appreciated that. School was the place for me that was the place that supported my uh, safety and development. And I have always wanted that to be the case for all other children. I also started teaching initially piano lessons um, when I was still in high school. And then I was able to be a teacher's aide in a Uh, urban classroom where I grew up and uh, loved doing that and then taught in after school programs. So when I got out of college uh, in 1973, it was a path that I really wanted to take into the classroom. Once in the classroom, you discover that 
Uh, there's a lot that's not under the control of the teacher that is defined by policies outside the school. And that drove me ultimately to uh, begin to do policy research and, you know, other policy work. And Linda, if you're comfortable sharing, where, where did you grow up? Grew up in Cleveland and taught in uh, New Jersey and Philadelphia. And those were formative experiences in uh, my teaching. I taught in big uh, urban factory model high schools mm. where it was clear that the school was not designed to support student success for all students or mm. to allow teachers to know their students well, where there was you know, a fragmented curriculum and teaching force. Uh, I also learned I didn't know all that I wanted and needed to know to serve my students well. And I saw the effects of inequality and in funding in mm. the schools in which I taught. So I left that experience determined to work on those problems. As we shift from your childhood upbringing and even your professional experiences, let's go to the, the book chapter itself. When we talk about the science of learning and development, which is language you didn't have, I'm guessing, when, when you first entered teaching. What do we need to know about the science of learning and development to shape policies in a way that will hopefully alter conditions for young people, like the, the conditions you experience firsthand as, as an educator? Well, I think the first thing that uh, the science tells us, and this is from neuroscience and learning science and developmental psychology and, and all of these fields coming together, first thing we learn is that the brain is malleable. It is always growing and learning throughout our entire lives. It is wiring, you know, the neurons that fire together, wire together. And the experiences and the relationships that we have determine what our brain architecture looks like and what we are able to learn and do. Uh, so the old idea that somehow you had genetic uh, imprint that, you know, was uh, available from birth and that you could be identified early on for what your potential would be and put in different tracks or pathways in school, which was, of course, done typically by race and class in the uh, factory model schools that we have inherited, uh, is completely uh, wrongheaded. The other thing we learn is that learning is social, emotional, and academic, that they are completely connected, that if you're in an environment of trust where you feel supported enabled, uh, where you feel that you can believe in your teachers and peers to work with you productively, you learn better. If you are distracted, if you are traumatized, if you are stigmatized in any way, uh, it actually impedes your learning. So the idea that social and emotional learning is a distraction from academic learning is completely false. It is, in mm -hmm. fact, the pathway to stronger academic learning. And finally, we also know that adverse conditions, that trauma does impact learning, but that strong relationships are the strongest antidote to the effects of trauma or adverse conditions, uh, that people learn through inquiring. We are inquiring human beings and successful learning engages students in inquiry and solving problems and answering meaningful questions and supports them with the right kind of direct instruction and scaffolding. So if you take what we know from the science, and there's much more that could be said, but those yep. are some of the big takeaways, schools would look a lot different from what they currently look like in many places. From your perspective, why have we been so slow to respond as a really democracy to emerging research. <laughs> I mean, why, why does the policy practice fear operate in such different ways? I think there are a number of reasons. One is that, you know, people are tied to the experiences they've had and the traditions. Mm -hmm. People know what school looked like when they went to school. That makes them an expert on what school should look like now. And uh, so that's one force uh, another is that inequality is baked into the warp and woof of our policy structure. Mm. So the innovative practices that may take off in some communities that have been well-resourced and have recruited and retained, you know, very um, well-prepared teachers are different than what happens in the context where we have uh, under-resourced schools and where they have a churn of teachers who come in and out often underprepared and not staying very long. So it's very hard to build those practices unless you can get to a place where your policy structure treats schools equitably, funds them, 
provides good training for educators so they learn the science, and then enables all of those well-prepared educators to be available to all students in all schools. When you think about Cleveland, Linda, and your, your childhood, and thinking about all that you know now about the current kind of ecosystem in which schools operate, what do you know now in terms of clarity, in terms of in thinking about what you would honestly do differently in, in the community where, where you grew up? Um, you talked about music education being kind of instrumental, but folks sometimes say, well, you choose music education or you choose athletics or you choose this subject area or that subject area, which are sometimes you know false arguments or, or sometimes we get kind of stuck in these places of either or not both and, but what would you go back and, and kind of tell the school system or maybe you've already had the opportunity to do so at this juncture in, in your life and your career? Well, I was fortunate to get a lot of good advantages in my education. So uh, much of what I experienced was on the heels of, you know, in the post-Sputnik era, there was a lot mm-hmm. of federal money coming into schools. There were mm-hmm. efforts to uh, support all kinds of science and mathematics innovation and, you know, uh, arts in the schools and all kinds of things. So we have in this country, we have cycles of investment and disinvestment in education. Uh, and people get very different experiences at very different moments in time, as well as in different places. Uh, but one thing I will say is that the schools that I came through, like many folks, including the big you know, high school experience, were highly tracked. My brother had uh, a number of learning difficulties, uh, and he had a very different experience in the highly tracked system than, than I did. And that was taken for granted at that mm. time. The understanding that you could teach in ways that enable students to learn even when they learn differently, that you could uh, organize for thoughtful instruction, that you could support students with integrated student supports and additional tutoring and physical and mental health supports was not prominent in that time. Uh, And those ideas are what is driving, I think, the transformation of schools today. It's what will allow all students to learn to high levels. Uh, We did not used to believe that that was necessary. We used to think that you could always sort of cream off a small number of students to give them certain kinds of advantages and let everybody else, you know, drop out of school if they wanted to, you know, go off and work in the farms and the factories and the mills that were um, the way in which the economy operated, you know. 50, 60, 70 years ago. Those jobs are being digitized and outsourced. Those jobs are no longer available. They don't make a living wage. And the thinking work that everyone needs to be able to do today is the kind of teaching and learning that was reserved to a small number of people. We have to figure out how to make that more widely available. Fortunately, I've worked with some brilliant educators who have created and redesigned schools in ways that really do provide a rich, empowering education for all students and get extraordinary results that would not have been possible in the designs of schools of the past. And so we really need to be paying attention to those schools and replicating the kind of work that they're able to do by creating the empowering teaching and integrated supports that allow students to flourish. Our Children Can't Wait is the book I wrote, and I made this podcast to have a conversation with you, precisely you, and so we can keep the conversation going and to hear what you think about the ideas brought up by this podcast, I want to encourage you to email me at joe at ourchildrencantwait.com. I'd love to hear from you. Our Children Can't Wait is a production sponsored by the Center for the Transformation of Schools at UCLA. And the book is published by Teachers College Press. Funding comes from the Stewart Foundation and the National Education Association. And if you haven't clicked follow on the podcast, please do that now. Rate and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. The current political landscape doesn't always embrace big ideas like community schools and whole child approaches. So I asked Linda, what gives her hope as we try to translate these big ideas into action? 
Well, I, several things give me hope. Of course, it's a few days before the election, so <laughs> we could talk again later. I was um, going to say, yeah. <laughs> but for one thing, uh, there is a much greater appreciation for the role of social, emotional, cognitive skills and how those interact and how important they are to develop in tandem. We have mm-hmm. social, emotional learning programs uh, and restorative practices that have been highly successful that have demonstrated that they uh, improve learning and academic performance as well as helping students become more resilient and persevering and develop the cooperation and collaboration skills that they need to succeed in life and in in work uh, when they leave school. So those things are much better understood. We have better teacher education programs than we used to some years ago, and many, many teachers are getting a very thorough grounding in the science, uh, both how you teach content and how you teach diverse learners and how you do that in successful ways. But at the same time, we have a lot of shortages that mean that people often get hired, particularly in high need schools, who have not had access to that preparation. So we know how to do it. We've got to make it more widely available. That means saying in this country, if you teach, we will pay for your education. It should be freely available because it's an investment in our children and their future, not a cost to the society. I'm also hopeful because there's a very big push right now in California and across the country for community schools, for schools that are designed to be connected to families and communities. They're designed to engage in inquiry-oriented, community-connected teaching and learning, to have available physical and mental health supports and social service supports so that and nutrition, uh, all the things that kids need to be able to thrive. Uh, to make sure that that's available to every child, extremely important in a society that says, has such a high rate of childhood poverty, uh, homelessness, food insecurity. We're doing this in California at a gigantic scale. A third of our schools will uh, be community schools supported with the funding to enable those kinds of practices routinely available in schools. So there's a lot of understanding that there was not widely available in the past and resources that are going to the right kinds of teaching and learning and schooling conditions. But we have to sustain it. We have to have both the research and the advocacy that makes it clear that this is a direction uh, for the future and not just the moment. Speaking of just the moment, This is just the moment to follow our Children Can't Wait wherever you get your podcasts to make sure you don't miss part two of the whole child approach. Dr. Shauna Cook helps us make sense of the science of learning and development as part of a whole child agenda. Shauna gives lots of great examples of her time as a student in Los Angeles and educator in New Orleans right after Katrina. You won't want to miss it. This is Our Children Can't Wait. Thanks for listening. I'm Joe Bishop. Our Children Can't Wait is a podcast by the Center for the Transformation of Schools in the School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. Support is provided by the Stewart Foundation and the National Education Association. Elizabeth Windham is the producer. Julia Windham is the associate producer. Geneva Sum is a creative director. And senior producer is Jay Woodward. Our Children Can't Wait is the companion to the book with the same name, Our Children Can't Wait, available now from Teachers College Press and Amazon. Our Children Can't Wait is produced by Winhaven Productions and Blue Jay Atlantic. <laughs>